That's okay. I need this. No, here it is. Yeah. Ah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Zimrick, and today I'm going to um, introduce you to the NASA Operational Simulator for Small Satellites, or what we like to call NOS Cubed. Um, I represent the NASA IVNV Independent Test Capability Team. We are a, um, a subgroup of the IVNV facility that's located in West Virginia. A little bit about uh, the agenda, what I'd like to talk to today is I'm going to give you an intro into a CubeSat project, STF-1, that will then set the stage for talking about NOS Cube later in the presentation. So to kind of understand what we're doing on our, our CubeSat, that will then lead to what we're doing on the SIM side as well. Um, I'll then introduce you to NOS Cubed version 1.0 of it, its architecture and the simulators that are included in it, and then just some conclusions after that. So independent test capability, um, who are we? Um, Steve Yoken gave a presentation on on Tuesday talking about some of the spacecraft simulators that we developed. We've developed full-scale simulators for James Webb Space Telescope. We're working on SLS, but our charter is to acquire and develop and manage test environments that enable the dynamic analysis of software behaviors. So we build simulators of spacecraft for independent testing at the IVNV facility. That's what the ITC independent test capability team does. That's our core work. So just a little bit more about us. Um, Steve talked about GIST. He talked about S3 and the issues and the independent testing that's going on with those. I'm not gonna talk about those. I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different for this team and some other areas we're starting to get into. But just so you're aware, um, we dabble in all the technologies mentioned here we, um, we have a lab associated with our team called JSTAR. It's the JSTAR lab, John McBride Software Testing and Research Lab. We, uh, we deploy all of our simulators um, uh, in an automated and virtual deployment. We have familiarity with Kimu RAD 750 models. We have experience with Kimu Leon 3 models. Um, if you're interested in any of that, please contact us. Um, we, are, we have years of experience doing Wind River Simix modeling. If you are looking to use Simix, contact us. I can guarantee you we can help you. And now we're starting to play into a new area of the small sats. So we have a mission, CubeSat mission, that's called Simulation to Flight 1, STF-1. It is a collaboration between NASA IVNV and West Virginia University, um, which, is, which is in Morgantown, West Virginia. This is a, going to be a 3U CubeSat. About a year ago, we submitted a proposal to the NASA CubeSat Launch Initiative, and we were accepted. What does this mean? This means that NASA will fund for the manifest and launch of our CubeSat. Um, it, is, it will be the first West Virginia CubeSat um, ITC is responsible for the CNDH side. That includes hardware and software, um, integration, and all testing from CNDH. West Virginia University is responsible for the payload, hardware, and software. They're doing the science part of it. They do the science, we do the CNDH. Um, STF-1, we consider ourselves a Goddard CubeSat. We are partnering with Goddard and Wallops, and we are very closely in touch with the Dellinger CubeSat team at Goddard. We, uh, we kind of consider Dellinger to be our big brother. We have modeled and chosen a lot of our hardware based upon the Dellinger CubeSat that's from Goddard. Our current launch ready date is going to be about August of 2016. And since these slides were put together, we have had some pings about being manifested possibly around June 2017. That's kind of hot off the press news. We're pretty excited about that. Um, so what's the primary objective? If you notice, the title of this is Simulation to Flight, STF-1. Our primary objective is to showcase the simulation technologies that we have been developing for years. This is just a different way for us to do it. And the secondary objective is WU Research and Sciences into Space Weather, Rad Hard Materials, 
navigation instruments, and a camera. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the hardware and the software of the CubeSat mission. Um, like I mentioned, we're working very closely with the Dellinger team. Um, our flight software is Core Flight System. Um, a certain percentage of it is going to be reused from Dellinger, particularly on the radio application. There's a particular radio that Dellinger is also flying. We're flying the same radio. They're working on the application. We're going to work with them and share that. Um, we are designing our own solar panels. And most of the hardware on this list um, is very similar to other CubeSats. And a lot of you who are in the CubeSat world will be familiar with it. Uh, and just, just a little bit of status as to where we are. Um, I always think this is good to show what some of the lead times are for CubeSat components that are COTS, but not really COTS. Um, Onboard computer, we received solar cells, we have received. Power system was a 10 week lead time. Chassis, unknown lead time. Um, we're designing our own solar cells. The radio was a six month lead time that we just received that radio last week. Uh, we waited about six months for it. We have a clean room that's been procured and now set up. Um, we are using the ISI space antenna that was mentioned in the um, earlier presentation. Um, unknown lead time on it, and we have received the camera. So that just gives you an idea of kind of where we are in, in, in receiving this hardware. Um, I just want to show a, uh, a picture and just walk down this very quickly. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. If you have more questions, you can see me or any, any of the other guys. We have a camera at the top. We will have a, a cadet radio. Our, our chassis is from ISI Space. Um, we have a IMU experiment as part of our science. Our flight computer is the Gome Space Nanomind A3200. This is a newer version of what Dellinger is flying from Gome Space. It's an AVR microprocessor. Dellinger's is an ARM. We have. Um, if you're online, could you please mute? Thank you. Uh, we have cloud space batteries and um, deployable antenna. Uh, this is a uh, this is an experiment here for for LEDs and rad hard components. We have a physics payload, a Novatel GPS, and once again the cloud space EPS. So this is just gives you, you know, kind of a 3D view of what we're looking at, and just a few more pictures because pictures are cool. Um, the card that we are we are designing this. And another picture of our stock there. And this is a picture of our clean room. And over on the right, a render. This is the, this is the, uh, the test rig that we're going to have for doing our integration. So let's talk a little bit more. Let's get away from the hardware a little bit. Let's talk about flight software for our CubeSat. We have STF-1 specific apps that we are developing. These will be running on core flight system, and we will be using the OSAL, the OS abstraction layer. If, if you're not familiar with the OSAL, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the CFS. Um, notice this line right here, I'm gonna be talking more about that a little later. Here we have FreeRTOS. That is the operating system that we were using on our CubeSat. The reason we chose FreeRTOS is because it has great vendor support from our vendor of our computer. Uh, that's really why we're using it. You buy the computer, it comes with libraries, drivers, and everything for your RTOS just ready for you to go. Uh, this is very similar to what um, the Dellinger mission is using. And then below here we have our flight hardware. You can consider the flight hardware box to be anything your flight software needs to communicate with. Uh, maybe this is I2C temperature sensors, gyros, um, science instruments, anything. So take a mental note of this of this image here. I'm going to build up on this as we as we go forward. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more. I've introduced you to our CubeSat STF-1. We'll talk about what we're really the focus of this mission is, which is going to be our simulator technology. And what we call it is the National, the NASA Operational Simulator for Small Satellites, NOS Cubed. So what is NOS Cubed? It is a software test bed. It's based upon STF-1 hardware, and you'll see what I mean by that in a moment when I go more into the 
into the sims that we've developed but we are trying to keep it sufficiently generic so other people can use it and when i show you a little more architecture i think you'll get a feel for what i mean there um, it is because our flight software is cfs based it does interface very well to cfs you wouldn't necessarily have to be using cfs to use nos cubed but we're flying CFS, the, the, the marrying of the two just make a lot of sense. Um, it's currently open loop, um, closed loop is planned. It's openly distributable, dis distributed solution that's ready to run. And I'm gonna talk more about ready to run on the next slide, but you see the next sentence there is, we're looking for users. So if there's anyone in the NASA community who's interested, I see a couple of hands, please contact us. Um, we would love to hear some feedback. Um, not on the phone. <laughs> Somebody else is itching. That's good. <laughs> yeah, they are. Okay, put the puppy away and please mute. You can put on mute. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a collection of Linux executable libraries. I mean, so, so what is it? It's Linux executable libraries. What's it used for? Well, this is what we're using it for in our mission. So I hope this use case will be good for anyone else using it, and maybe some more. Um, we're doing it for early flight software development. We, um, we're looking for it to provide real world inputs to our flight software, just so we can get data moving around our CNDH software. That's what we're, that's what we're using it for right now. Eventually we'll use it for flight software VNV testing, we can inject invalid inputs, behavior, stress conditions. Definitely going to use it for integration. Used for early app development, payload team integration, and mission planning and power analysis. All CubeSats are power constrained. This is, this is probably going to be a big one here. That's what we're looking to use it for. So I mentioned ready to run. What is that? Um, we, I mentioned earlier that we leverage virtual machine technologies. We, we deploy virtual machines in automated ways. Um, we're looking to do the same here. We don't distribute virtual machines. If you come to us, we're not going to just hand you a huge 10 gig, 20 gig virtual machine. We give you the abilities to build these on the fly using tools that are already out there. Um, they're, they're, if you're familiar with Vagrant, Puppet, Shell Provisioners, that's what we use and we have all this set up. So to give you an idea of, of the steps, the, uh, if, if you want to do this for yourself, the first thing you would do is talk to us, obtain the files from us. We have everything in a Git repo. You can get access to our Git repo. After that, you install Virtual Ma Machine Provisioner. We use VirtualBox. Um, no, no particular reason, we just use VirtualBox. You run one command and you generate your virtual machine at this point, you log into the virtual machine and build CFS with a ready to run script that we've already created. So this is actually how we do our own development. We maintain this virtual machine. We add to it all the time. It's a good way to get new team members up and running quickly. We also really use it for, maybe I have a bullet on that, um, science integration. Since we're working with West Virginia University, we make this technology, this virtual machine, we hand it over to them and say, here you go. You have now at your disposal a running CFS flight software that you can write your own science apps in, make sure they work, test them out, and get a feel for how they work long before they get to our part when we're starting to do the integration. Um, and along those same ideas, we use it for development. We're using it for our NOS cubed environment. We also have installed in the virtual machine ground system software, whether you're using ITOS or Cosmos. Um, we also have that installed just out of the box, ready to use. And we hope to use it for integration testing as well. Um, just, just so we're clear on what it is, I put this slide in here just to show that our flight software is a Linux process. NOS engine, I haven't, haven't even mentioned that before. It's the first time I've mentioned NOS Engine. Think of it as middleware that connects all the sims together as part of NOS Cubed. Um, NOS, NASA Operational Simulator is kind of our product line. Engine is middleware that we have developed that we use on all of our other simulators. 
The ones that we presented and talked about before, like GIST for James Webb and SLS, we use Engine on those as well. So just think of it as middleware that kind of bridges the gap between flight software on the left and your sims on the right. So we released version one of NOS Cubed um, about a month ago. And this is what it had included as far as simulators go. The first one was a magnetometer. It's a modeled after the Honeywell HMC 5843. And it's currently being used for a source of data for developing our flight software. EPS system. We modeled our EPS simulator from a commercial off the shelf cloud space system. And we're using it for power analysis, software control switches. GPS. Our GPS simulator is modeled after the Novotel and it's used for a data source giving realistic GPS um, commanding and telemetry. Camera, uh, listed here, the RGCAM Mini, that's the camera modeled, and we're using it basically for software development. Um, just some cool pictures of these items down here at the bottom. So this is version one of NOS Cube, and I'm gonna talk about version two in a little while. So I, I believe you could probably imagine why we chose this hardware for version one. This is the hardware we're flying on our mission, STF-1. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about the architecture of NOS Cubed a little bit and show you how it doesn't really matter what hardware you're using. I think we have this sufficiently generic where we could, we could write multiple models and plug it into our architecture. So if, if you're thinking of NOS Cube as a box, now we're starting to go inside that box a little bit and pick out the pieces some. Um, I mentioned engine. It's a middleware for passing messages around. We use it on our sims. And how's it used in engine and in NOS Cube? It serves as the glue to tie all the components together. Um, the next component in NOS Cube is a hardware model. So this is going to be specific hardware model, specific GPS, specific um, power system. Maybe you have a particular gyro. You're going to have a hardware model of that that you probably kind of wrote yourself. That's that's the other component here. And finally, um, we are using currently 42. And we refer to it as, I don't know if you're familiar with 42. I probably should describe what it is. It is an open source general purpose simulator that's developed at Goddard for spacecraft attitude and orbit dynamics. So if you're not familiar with it, just Google it. You'll find it out there. It, it's available. We refer to 42. It's, a, it's, it's an environment data provider. And that's, that's the words we use here. Um, it serves to provide, you know, any, any real world um, position, attitude, um, location, environment data that your CubeSat needs to know about. Um, so for an example, um, in 42, there is a model of the magnetic field around the Earth. We have a magnetometer um, hardware model. Um, that magnetometer, magnetometer hardware model is fed from the magnetic field model that 42 provides. So that's why we refer to this as the environment data provider. Um, we don't necessarily have to use 42. It's just one that we had some experience with and that's what we chose. We're also thinking of using um, let's see, was SDK. We've also dabbled a bit in SDK too. Um, but, but 42 is nice. It, it, does, it does run on Linux. And we are, we are all Linux at the moment, so that's, that's one reason we chose it. So if you look at this, uh, these block diagrams here on the bottom, um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you where the flight software is. But think of the flight software off to the left where I'm standing. You have an engine interface that serves as the glue. You then have your hardware model, and on the back end, you have your data provider. The hardware model would be a magnetometer model, a GPS model. Feeding those would be an environment data provider like 42. Just to show you a little bit about how this expands with different models, you have your flight software to the left of this line. Each of your models then gets tied together with NOS engine here as your glue. And then you have your individual model sims going down the line all tied to one environment data provider. So going back to um, where I showed kind of our flight software stack earlier, I've added a couple new boxes here and let's take a look at them. 
Um, nothing above this line has changed. We still have, we're still running CFS, we still are running the OSAL. There are no changes above this line. What's new on the bottom is we've now added, now on the right side, this is what we had before. We had our free RTOS block, we had our flight hardware block. None of that's changed. What I've added new is the dotted line and everything to the left. This is now a Linux x86 target and NOS cubed running here. So everything to the right is your flight target. Everything to the left is running on Linux fed by NOS cubed simulators. I uh, just have to throw in uh, CMake here if anyone's interested. We use CMake for building all of our flight software and NOS cubed. Um, just want to throw that in there. So we're going to, so building, building upon that idea, now I've expanded the NOS cube block in the lower left hand corner and I've added a few more information here. So now you have engine, you have your hardware models that we just discussed, and you have your environment data provider. Um, for Linux, I've added a few targets here just for some information. Could be x86, could be ARM, could be Raspberry the Pi. Basically anything that runs Linux would kind of fall on this side of the branch. Over on the right, we have free RTOS running on our flight target, which is an AVR32, and we still have our flight hardware. I've made no changes above this line to the flight software, and that's, that's our main goal here, is we don't want the flight software to think that it's running differently, whether we have a simulator tied, tied to it or actual flight hardware. That's, that's what we're trying to do here. We want to easily flip a switch, develop and run tests over here, and then take that, rebuild for a flight target, and run it over here. And a little more information. The only thing different here is I've really added a hardware library here. Um, you may be wondering, well, how, how are you doing this abstraction? Because at some point, your code has to know whether it's talking to real hardware or simulated hardware. Um, this is based upon Dellinger's design also, is that we have a hardware library that is a CFS library. Um, everything above this point, um, flight software just makes function calls and it doesn't know whether it's talking to the left side where the simulators are or to the right side where the flight target is. And so depending upon what, where, which one you're building for, you can just swap in and out, maybe a library and flip between the two targets. So that's kind of how we do the abstraction here. So we spend all of our time up in this area, up in the CFS world, um, writing our apps, testing our flight software. Um, as an example, we're working on a GPS app right now. Uh, the GPS app does functions, needs, needs functions like read UART. Um, when it calls read UART, it doesn't know where it's calling the read UART function from. That's, that's prototyped in the hardware lib. It just so happens that depending on where we're running, you can link in a read UART that's talking to a UART on your flight hardware, or your read UART function is coming down in here and hitting your GPS hardware model, getting data from 42 and sending it back up. When we're working on our app that's running up here in CFS, it doesn't care where this data is coming from. And that's where we're working on now. We have actually spent more time maturing NOS cubed it's farther along now than what our flight software is for our CubeSat mission. So now that we've got some ability to pump data into our flight software, we're going back now and actually really working on our flight software right now. So future plans for NOS Cube um, version two. Um, this is what we have on our immediate um, plan. We're gonna add a three axis gyroscope. We're gonna add temperature sensors. We're going to mature our EPS. We feel like the EPS sim is going to be very important for power analysis, and we're going to mature that some. Um, we are considering about doing the L3 Cadet radio sim. It has, the, the, this radio has particular high priority and low priority cues, and managing those from the flight software side is going to be very important. You know, when I say we're going to model the radio, we're not going to model the hardware of the radio. We're not going to model the RF side. We're going to model how the software interfaces with that radio and manages those cues. So we are considering that. Um, we are looking into visualization and a user interface. 
um, we're, we're looking into Cosmos and Atos, and we're also considering Titer 42 integration. Um, right now, we don't have um, real tight integration into 42. We're thinking about programmatically um, syncing um, like flight software time with 42 and having a, a more synchronized system. In our, um, traditionally in our sims like James Webb and for SLS, we, we understand time very well. We know who ha who's the time master and everything. Um, right now we're still, we're still flushing this out a little bit, but, but we're going to uh, probably, probably do a tighter 42 integration. It's a little bit more on the work in progress. Um, so I've added, I've added a couple new things. Let's look on the left. Um, we are evaluating ITOS and Cosmos, and just last week we were successful in getting Cosmos hooked up to our CFS flight software, and we were seeing telemetry coming from our simulators um, up through CFS, through our flight software, and coming down to Cosmos, um, like GPS, magnetometer, power. Um, so we have our flight software asking, so you ask, asking what it thinks is the hardware for that data. That data is coming up. Flight software is seeing it. It's doing its thing in CFS. It's getting sent out over UDP, over the, the telemetry output app, if you're familiar with CFS, and it's making its way down to Cosmos. So that was kind of our first, first real view of the, this entire system working, where, where you have data coming all the way from 42, making its way up to flight software, flight software processing it, doing something with it, packing it into telemetry, and then putting it into the Cosmos ground station here. Um, I added a new box here in the middle, a hardware adapter, and I just listed an example of I squared C and SPI. We are also considering uh, making a link for NOS engine and bridging this gap between simulator and flight hardware. I have a couple more slides after this, but I think you can see what this will do. Now we can start mixing and matching. We are interested, there, it, the leads times that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, some of those are huge, and we don't know when we're getting equipment. So we may start doing a hybrid approach and developing flight software with SIMs where we don't have hardware, and when we do have hardware, we use that hardware. And also, we may use Cosmos as our main interface to NOSQ. Right now there really is no, we, we haven't spent any time on a custom user interface for our simulators. We, we always usually tend to gravitate toward using the ground system as the main user interface. So we're, we're considering using Cosmos as that interface as well. Um, and this just shows a little bit more about the hybrid approach. On the left side would be flight software running on Linux. On the right side would be flight software running on our target, uh, the Nanomine. I'm not going to go into each block. The, the most important thing you can see is on the, on the Linux side with flight software running, you would have our engine middleware using hardware adapters that then you could hook hardware to, but then you could also have SIMs sitting out over here communicating. On the flip side, you could do something like, well, I'm running on my Nanomine in the clean room. I want to test something. Um, I can go through a software layer. I can use hardware adapters, and I can hook up SIMs as well as the hardware. So we're, we're, we're kicking around the idea of mixing and matching that a little bit. Uh, a little bit of the visualization was one of the things we're looking at for in the future. We've done a little bit of visualization. This is from 42. 42 gives you the ability to do some visualization. I just threw this up for an example. And this is a screen snapshot of Cosmos and some of our telemetry that we were getting into it. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned Cosmos is, op is also um, open source. It is, it is available. That's one of the reasons we were trying it out and using it. Um, we want to make this ready to run. Um, we want to be able to provide it to just about anyone without any restrictions. So we're we are trying to go toward free open source solutions as part of our NOS Cube system. So with that, um, please, if you have any questions, go ahead. Um, let us know if you're interested in this. We would love to have feedback. Um, please let us know.